Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to Transition Tuesdays. I just want to remind everybody that this session is being recorded, so keep in mind when you're discussing any personal information, and please keep yourself muted. If you have a question, you can raise your hand, but only um, ask questions for clarifying purposes. We'll have time at the end for question and answers. Okay. So thank you, everyone. And I just want to introduce Dr. Patricia Anderson. Dr. Anderson has worked in the field of special education since 1975 as a special education instructor in grades 6 through 12, an adult education teacher and diagnostician, learning specialist at the college level, technical assistance consultant, trainer, university adjunct faculty. Dr. Anderson was also an educational consultant in, in a joint position between the Department of Rehabilitation Services and the Connecticut State Department of Education Bureau of, Second, of Special Education Services as a secondary transition coordinator. She currently serves in the advisory board and the program development committee for the Connecticut Youth Leadership. Dr. Anderson has over 40 years of experience in teaching special education at the middle and high school levels, as well as in higher education and adult education and consulting with the community, adult service employment agencies. She received a PhD in educational psychology and special education, and she, she has concentrations in post-secondary learning disabilities, diagnostic placements, assessments rather, universal design, print accessibility, and secondary transition. So welcome, Dr. Anderson. Thank you. Thank you very much, and welcome to all of you. I am thrilled to be able to um, present this information to you. And as I'm listening to my bio, I'm noticing my gray hair. So that's where it all comes from. So I'm going to start out with um, a PowerPoint. Um, the topic of, of community-based transition services for students who are 18 to 22, and I may say 21, but it means 22 now, um, since that changed since I retired in 2018. Um, it's a fairly complex process, and I'm going to just kind of highlight some of the issues, and I will provide you with uh, a lot of resources, so you may feel a little overwhelmed with information by the end, but towards the end, we're going to start talking about how you request transition-only services and what processes you can go through. And although Laura did not say this, um, I'm happy to hang around for a little bit, even after we end at 8.30, right? 7, 8.30, um, if you have some questions. So I'm going to share screen. I'm not real technologically savvy, but I think I can do this. And Laura, you can tell me if you can't see it. There we go. All right, everybody see the screen, the PowerPoint? Okay, so I do have my contact information on here. Um, I welcome any of you to email me if you have additional questions afterwards. And if it gets to be too complex, we'll talk about doing it in a different way. But I am happy to, to email with people as you need it. So this is our, um, let's see if I can hide that. This is um, the objectives for tonight. Um, prior to the information being put on the State, State Department of Ed's website, the only place that information was in writing about the community-based 18 to 22 services was in the Transition Bill of Rights. So we're gonna look at that very briefly. Um, we're gonna explore what community-based transition services mean and what some of the options are in Connecticut. When we first started this, which was in the 19, late 1980s, there were very few states that were doing this. Um, but as I look around the country now, more and more states are providing services to their, transition services to their students who are 18 to 22, which is really as it should be. Um, we'll talk a little bit about the components of what a transition uh, community-based transition services should have or transition only services. And then finally, um, look at requesting those services through the IEP and PPT process. <clears throat> I also believe that Beth posted um, uh, uh, 
Word document that has a number of additional resources. Some I will refer to and some are just uh, additional links. Uh, some are training programs, some are videos, and some are um, documents that you might find useful as you go through this process. So what are community-based 18 to 22 transition services? Why do we have them? So IDEA requires districts to provide services to students with disabilities up to the age of 22, at least in Connecticut. And I refer you to the updated guidance on the state's website for more information about the switch from age 21 to 22, which happened, I believe, in 2019, 19 or 20, um, or until they receive a regular high school diploma. Um, IDEA also requires districts to provide transition services to any student who's receiving special education to improve their post school outcomes. So that's why we have transition only services who provides transition only services. So we have school districts, private organizations, approved private special ed programs, otherwise known as APSEP, colleges and universities. Um, and those are the primary areas. And we'll talk a little bit about where you can find those services listed on the state's website um, and how to uh, research them. So who can receive transition only services? Students with disabilities who are receiving special education services who have met their graduation requirements or are not receiving a high school diploma. They're receiving a certificate. Oops, went backwards. So in Connecticut, this is what transition services look like. And it may be slightly different from state to state. So in Connecticut, the services are for students who are 18 to 22. Previously, we used to call them age appropriate services or occasionally refer to them as a fifth year or a sixth year, depending on how many years after the four years of high school a student might be in those services. It's only available to students who have completed academic credits towards graduation with a regular high school diploma or who will be receiving a certificate, either a certificate of attendance or a certificate of completion. Um, Students who leave school and get a GED can come back into their high school and take transition only services because a GED is not considered to be a regular high school diploma. The discussion about whether or not your child is gonna be receiving a high school diploma or a certificate should really happen in ninth grade when the student enters high school, maybe even slightly before that. Many students who have more significant disabilities, the school will agree to, to keep that student in special education until 21. But for many students who are receiving transition only services, they're initially expecting to graduate in four years. And it isn't usually until their sophomore, junior, maybe even senior year that they realize that they really haven't completed enough transition services to be prepared for life after high school. So it's not a decision that's made in ninth grade that you're gonna go into transition only services. And I'll elaborate on that a little bit as we go along. In Connecticut, we had a class action lawsuit many years ago um, that indicated that many students were in a more segregated okay. setting. So we have a policy that says students must be involved at least 80% of their time with non-disabled peers. And this link, it's to a document that gives you more detail on what that means in terms of transition. When I first came on board in 2005, we had some age appropriate programs that were housed on a college campus but the students would go to the college and be in a classroom with their disabled peers for most of the day. So they really weren't getting out into the community except for a small amount of time. And that's where the 80% came in. The whole purpose of community-based transition only services is to place the student as much as possible in a setting where they may have to function 
after they leave high school. So if you're functioning in a high school and students are learning how to do their laundry in um, what I used to call a home ec classroom, I think they call it consumer sciences now, um, that's not where they're gonna be doing their laundry once they leave high school. So it's better to get them out in the community and teach them about how to do laundry in a laundromat, for example. So we really uh, don't call these services, community-based transition services, unless the students can be out in the community, either working, uh, participating in activities, going to restaurants, going grocery shopping, anything can be in the community, it doesn't have to be work, um, but it has to be 80% of the time. So when I left in 2018, I would probably say about 99% of the programs that were transition only services were 80% of the time with non-disabled peers. So they might spend a little bit of time um, with their peers who have disabilities, uh, but most of the time they were out in the community. So I will clarify that peers for transition age students is anyone their own age or older. So it could be college age students, it could be adults. <clears throat> Services are provided 100% in the community. We originally had transition based, community based transition only services divided into three categories with some school districts providing those services on their high school campus and others out in the community. That's all been combined. But <clears throat> one of the things I often will tell a school district is when your child or your student is going to work, they don't go on a big yellow school bus. So they need to know how to function and get around in the community um, without always always relying on the supports and services that they might have had when they're in the high school. Now this part is a little tricky and I hope it will get clearer as we go along. This is something that parents may hear from districts. The state does not certify or license community-based transition only services, but they do recognize them as being qualified. And I'm gonna go through what those criteria are. You may have a school district that says to you, oh, you want your child in X program, but the state doesn't recognize that program, so I can't place them in that program. So I just want you to know that is not true. While the state does have a list of qualified transition-only services, any district can place any student in any program they feel is appropriate for that student. So if they say they can't do it because it's not on the state list, that's not 100% accurate. And the primary reason for that is if it's not on the state list, they can't get reimbursed for any expenses that go above and beyond what they would spend for other students. That also is sometimes a myth because many times transition only services don't ever meet the criteria for reimbursement. So just know with all this gobbledygook that a district can place a student in any program they feel is appropriate and meets the needs of those students or that student, sorry. All right, so I wanted to just give you a little background. We're gonna talk about the Transition Bill of Rights because it's bigger than just community-based transition services, although I'm not going to go through those sections. But beginning with 2015-16, there was some legislation that said we had, the State Department of Education had to pass out Transition Bill of Rights to parents whose child was receiving special education services in grades six through 12, and that law is still in place. We placed uh, an additional criteria on the IEP that said, not only must you receive that transition bill of rights, but transition should be discussed starting in sixth grade. And I know for a fact that the quality of those discussions varies from district to district, and sometimes it doesn't happen. But you should be able to request at grade six PPT meetings that they discuss transition with you. 
Um, so that's one way of bringing the topic up, even though formal transition services by law don't start until a child is 15 or 16, um, it can happen earlier if the PPT decides it's appropriate to happen. And certainly this discussion should happen well before um, the child turns 15 or 16. In addition, in that legislation, the district is also supposed to provide you with um, any documents that come out of the State Department of Ed that regard IEPs and transition and building a bridge is the one primary, primary document that um, the state has published that uh, talks about transition. So all of this is documented on page 10 of the current IEP. And I'm well aware that a new IEP is coming up down the road and that may change things a little bit, but I've starred the area where you should look on page 10 of the IEP to make sure they check off what documents they provided to you and what date they gave you and discussed. You see where the little arrow is? It says discuss transition services. So just so you know, that is your right to have that discussion starting in grade six. So this is basically just a snapshot of what the transition bill of rights looks like and it has not been updated to age 22, um, which takes precedence over 21, which it says in here. So number two is no longer accurate, um, but you can refer to the document I mentioned on the website before to talk about students leaving when they turn 22. But I'm gonna go on to the second page. Number 10 is, is where we talk about what community-based transition only services are and what some of the criteria are. So I'm gonna spell it out for you rather than trying to have you read that tiny little print. So it has to be a PPT recommendation. Certainly you as a parent or as the student can come in and say, I don't think I'm ready to graduate. Um, typically the, the verbiage that we use is, I wanna refuse my diploma and continue on for transition only services. Um, and I'll go into what that means. Um, but you can come in with a request and the PPT can deny it. And then you had to have due process rights to go through and, and fight that. But I'm finding more and more districts are encouraged to provide transition only services. Um, and sometimes even the school wants it and the student doesn't, um, which is okay. If the student doesn't want the services, they don't have to take those services. Um, it's a recommendation that isn't from 18 to 22. It has to be reviewed annually. Sometimes transition only services might happen over the summer, sometimes for a semester, sometimes for a year, sometimes for two years, sometimes until the student turns 22, but it's looked at on an annual basis with the, with the concept that if a student isn't ready can you put together services that will get them ready in a semester? And then they can start their life after high school. So they, they determine when they're ready as well as the PPT can determine when they're ready um, to start pursuing their, their future goals for life after high school. So that's why it has to be reviewed at least annually. Secondly, it doesn't have to be a specialized program. Otherwise you're trying to fit a square peg into a round hole. There aren't any programs that will meet 100% of an individual student's needs. And it has to be their individual needs, okay? Not generic needs. The law says it has to be a coordinated set of activities. So you may find a transition only program that meets maybe 60% of the student's goals and objectives but then you may have to bring in other services. Maybe the student needs some social skills services, or maybe the program doesn't have a good uh, worksite placement program and you have to bring an, in another consultant to provide that activity. So it has to be coordinated, but it can be a number of activities that are put together. It doesn't even have to be a formalized program. 
The students are able to um, decide if they want to participate in the graduation and senior activities of the class um, that they would normally have graduated with, or they can wait until they exit and participate with their peers at that time. That's a decision that's made in the PPT um, prior to uh, agreeing to provide them transition only services. Um, and that is actually now in the special education regulations. However, one of the things that some students find difficult is they cannot receive their actual diploma nor their certificate at graduation. They would get the same folder as everybody else and it would either be blank or there might be some other kind of document that's in there. Because once they receive the diploma or their certificate, they are exited from the special education database and they're no longer enrolled in school and eligible to receive special education services. So whatever time they decide to exit, whether it's two weeks, they decide it's not for them, or it's another two years, the date that's on the diploma or the certificate will be their exit date, the date they actually leave the high school and are withdrawn from the special education database. Typically, we discuss receiving transition only services um, in a student's junior year, maybe senior year, end of junior year, beginning of senior year. The reason for that is because transition is to be provided to all students starting when they turn 16 which means in the IEP when they turn are turning 15. So at the PPT, when they are 15 and they're writing the IEP that will be in place when they turn 16, that's when transition goals and objectives are supposed to be um, discussed. Transition is not something you put off until they earn their diploma and then you go into transition only services because looking at the courses they take, the activities that they do throughout high school, um, many schools have work experience programs before they get into transition only services. So they should be working on what they wanna do after high school, um, at least for three or four years while they're still in, in high school. So that's why it's not discussed usually until towards the end of their four years and everybody realizes, you know, I don't think this student is really ready, um, needs more of this, needs more of that. I'm reminded of two specific students that have stayed with me all this time. One was a young man who was a high functioning student on the autism spectrum. He did very well uh, academically. Um, and all of a sudden the school realized in his senior year he never worked. He'd never even been out in a work site. He had no idea what he wanted to do for employment. And college, you don't go to college just to go to college. You usually go to college to prepare for some kind of employment or work, um, at least moving in that direction. So he went into a transition only program, even though he was accepted out of college, they put him on a delayed admissions and he worked in uh, worksite settings for I think a year, but that's what he needed for his transition services. The other story is not quite as positive, but there was a young man who had a physical disability, I believe CP, had difficulty communicating, and it wasn't until his senior year that his mother actually found a device that helped him to be able to communicate to people. What they found was this student was college level material and they were gonna put him in a restaurant folding napkins because he couldn't communicate what he could do. So for him, the transition services were taking college level college prep courses. That's unusual because a student's not usually taking courses at the high school. Um, once they technically receive their diploma, but in this case, that's what the student needed to be able to pursue his goal of attending college. So it really does have to be an individualized approach. 
Um, transition only services don't take the place of transition goals and objectives that are supposed to start at age 16. Um, it should supplement or add to. Many students don't have as much time to spend on transition services as they need to because they're working on their high school diploma. And so that's why once those credits are out of the way, they can focus on more of the activities. And once it's only transition services, they may be able to do it in, a, like I said, a summer, a semester, a year, and they and be able to move on to uh, what their goals are. Students who are in transition only services can take academic courses, but it's not for graduation, it's not for credit. So there was one young man who wanted to work in the food service industry, but for a variety of reasons, he was never, never able to take a food service course at the high school. So that was one of the things he did. However, that's not where most of our transition only students would typically take their academic courses. So if he could take a cooking class or some kind of culinary class at a community college or an adult education program, I would much prefer that because that's where they're going to be learning from the time that they exit high school on. But it's not something that I can decide, it's something the PPT, the parents and the student have to decide where is the best place for a student to take the academic credits. So that's kind of transition services in a nutshell. Um, some states only have one of these models. We have, oh, I forgot to count them, but I'm sure we have well over 150 transition only services throughout the state from all the different organizations that I mentioned that can provide them. I wanted to just hi highlight for you some of the models. We have some, a few colleges and universities that are, um, or sorry, we have some programs that are based on a college campus, either a two year or a four year. Um, many of those are run by districts. Some are run by private organizations. We have some transition only services in a work ba workplace base, their workplace base. So they might be in a hospital or they might be in a hotel or they might be in a retail uh, facility. Um, we have some that are in the community, but not in a college site. So they might be housed in an apartment or a house, an administration building or a storefront. We have others that have multiple sites. There's one program that has a section on a college campus and then another in a house nearby on the college campus, which allows them to take different levels of students at the different sites that they run and go back and forth. We actually have one, I think it's still operating this way, um, that has no permanent location. There used to be two, but I believe there's still only one. And the rationale for that is some school districts find it difficult to be able to find or lease an offsite location, which is preferred to having a location in or on, a, on the high school campus because they're not going to be in that high school campus once they leave um, high school. But what Fairfield did is they have a different location every day. So they might meet at the community center one day, they might meet on a college campus another day and the students are all taken. I believe they're dropped at the high school and then they have transportation to wherever they're meeting for that day. And then usually in the evening, in the afternoons rather, is when they go out to their various work sites. So that's how one and, and Trumbull was the other school that did that, but now they, I believe they have a permanent location. Um, so it, it isn't a barrier to not be able to afford or find a permanent location for transition only services. Some of the Districts have a collaboration with multiple districts. There's two that I'm aware of. One is op operated by CREC, it's the STRIVE program down along the shoreline. And then there's the Farmington Valley Transition Academy, which is Farmington and Simsbury located at the University of Hartford. There are 
two programs that are located and run by colleges. One is Thames Academy at Mitchell College and the other is Step Forward at Gateway Community College and those are operated by the college. Um, there are a number of transition only services that are run by approved private special education programs. Not all of them have transition, but some of them do. Then we have a couple of longstanding private organizations that have uh, vocational programs and they also accept transition only students. One being Vista, which is down along the shoreline and the other is Chapel Haven in New, ha New, New Haven, which is, um, does a lot of work with students who are on the spectrum. There is a program called Project Search which is the transition only services that many other states use. It's a very um, prescriptive model and it's usually within one location. Um, FAVAR, which is the, uh, uh, an ARC, brought in Project Search into the Yukon Health Center and it's been functioning there for quite a number of years. And I put a link in this slide to a page in the DDS, the Department of Developmental Services that took Project Search and has expanded it to five additional sites. So these are now available, um, I believe to transition only students, but also to adults who have graduated um, or exited high school to give them the same kind of community-based experiences. And usually they're in one, um, one type of employment site. The last one is, is relatively new, uh, and this is a college and a private organization collaboration. The one that's in this state is called College Steps, and I have a link to their website. They started out at Norwalk Community College and they've been there for a number of years. And a couple of years ago, they started out at Conn College in New London. And that's another option, particularly if a student needs support, uh, preparing them to go off into a college setting. So you can see in Connecticut, we have many different ways of doing transition only services. So that makes it even more complex to find just the right match for an individual student. I'm gonna show you a few slides. Um, when I left, Alicia Trakas uh, took uh, over the position of the um, transition and she did a fabulous job with other people who worked on this with her updating the State Department of Ed secondary transition website. So I'm just going to highlight for you um, so where you can find some of the information that I'm talking about. Um, so if you go on to the, the uh, special education, uh, the department's website, you click on pro, uh, special education, then programs and services, and then you can scroll down and click on secondary transition. Get to secondary transition programs, and they, this is where they have added the information about, as you can see, it's 18 to 21, but it should be 18 to 22. Everybody has to update that information in all of our documents. And so this is at section 10 that I showed you um, directly out of the Transition Bill of Rights. I just wanted you to have another place that you could find it. Further down on that page, we're gonna cover some of this information. It begins to give you a description of the two types of community-based transition-only services. And it also shows you how to get into EdSight which is the state's database, public database, where you can also find all of the programs listed. And I'm gonna show you what that looks like. So this is EdSite. And if you go to the top of the page where it says overview, Laura, can you see my arrow? Okay, so where it says overview, if you click on that little button and then go to find a district, this page will pop up. And you'll see right here, well, it's not this page, but something will pop up that this section on the left is there. And you click on transition programs 
and you will have all of the transition only services that the state has, I don't wanna say approved, that has considered are qualified to be on this list. Um, there isn't a lot of information, but there's usually a phone number and a website so that you can um, get a little bit more information about the service. Um, we used to have a directory, which I believe is still there somewhere, but it's certainly not been updated. So you can then also over here sort by, I believe these are listed by district. No, these are listed by um, the name of the program. Um, and you can also sort alphabetically, you can sort by location, um, you can sort by district. So you can find any number of programs here, but you'll have to go searching further to get a little bit more detail. So the first type of program is what we call a public transition program. And that is a program that is operated by a school district or a RESC. These are the criteria for inclusion in EdSite. Um, it's either located in a, in a district high school, on a high school campus, or in a community location, which is the preferred location to really give the student the best experience of what it's gonna be like after high school. Only provided to students between the ages of 18 to 22 who completed academic credit, credits towards a high school diploma or are not working on one. And students are only working on secondary transition goals and objectives through an IEP, not credits towards a diploma. If they're working on credits towards a diploma, they're still registered in the high school, they may participate in a portion like the worksite experience portion of one of these programs, but they're still technically a high school student, not in a transition only program. The other type of program is what we call uh, tr uh, transition vocational service providers. Those are typically what we call non-public or private vendors who might, a district might contract with them to provide transition vocational services. So they have to have a valid contract with a vendor, which is usually Bureau of Rehab Services, Board of Edu Bureau of, Re of Education Services for the Blind, and, or the Department of Developmental Services. And I won't go into detail, but it's not that easy to get that kind of a vendor status any longer. So there are some programs out there that might be very good, just not be able to be listed on the state's website. So that's why I don't want you to take a district's word that they can't use a vendor or a program because they're not on the ed site list. College Steps is one of them. College Steps is a very, very well-known program, but because they haven't been able to get uh, a vendor contract with one of these organizations for a variety of reasons, not because they don't qualify, um, they're not on that qualified list on Ed site, but that doesn't mean a district can't place a student in that program. Um, they also have to serve students between the ages of 18, oops, see here, I missed one, it should be 18 to 22, um, who's completed academic credits. Um, and again, these particular providers can only provide transition vocational services. They cannot provide academics towards a diploma. They might have to provide functional academics like balancing a checkbook, doing that kind of math, uh, learning some computer skills, but they're all, all functional in relation to a student learning a career path or preparing for a particular job or independent living. Um, the next slide I'm gonna show you is a portion of this survey. This survey is on the website that I just showed you before, and it will give, it's the survey that a program that wants to get into EdSite has to complete. So it will give you some of the services that you might inquire about um, when you're looking at the services that are available um, uh, in a community-based program. So this is one page, 
And all of these boxes that are up here on the top are uh, just some of the services that these programs might provide. They're not limited to this. Um, I'm not sure who keeps this survey once it's filled out by these programs, um, but you might be able to ask at the State Department and see if they have any of these services uh, or surveys that the programs have completed. And they also here are required to tell whether they are 80 to 80% to 100% time with non-disabled peers. And if they aren't, you might wanna find out why and ex exactly how their students are uh, spending their time if they're not out in the community. Okay, so I have my little bar up here, so I can't, <clears throat> I can't find my, oh, I can't read the header. So what are community-based 18 to 22 transition only services? So students work only on transition skills. They gain experience in employment, training, or post-secondary education and independent living, which is required under IDEA. They have to participate at least 80% of their time with peers, peers without disabilities. So when you're looking at a district that has a program, transition only program that's located, let's say in the high school building, the other students who are in the building might be peers. Uh, actually, they won't be their peers because these students are older. So they won't be peers. Um, they are students without disabilities, but most of the time the students wouldn't be interacting with them. They would only be interacting with the other students in the program who all have disabilities. So they're not students without disabilities. So when you are looking at where a program is located, you really wanna take a look at why are they, how are they getting out into the community? What are they doing out in the community? Are they working in the community? Are they learning in the community? Are they learning how to get around in the community? Um, that is a really critical piece. The other part of this is there are some really good transition only programs, particularly on college campuses throughout the country. And sometimes a family will decide that this is the best thing for their child. I want to send them to this college that's down in Georgia or in Maryland because, or in New York because they have a great program. Just like your children without disabilities, you need to consider where they're going to be functioning after high school. If they're gonna be coming home to your home community, having them be in a different state or a different town, learning about that community and how to get around in that community is only gonna put them back in the eight ball when they get back into your community if that's where they're going to be living. So sometimes even though the program might be great, is it really preparing your child to have the skills needed wherever they're going to be living after high school? It's not impossible for a student with a disability to go away to a program like that and decide to stay there and find supports for living and employment and so forth. Just like our students who go away to college who don't have disabilities would then find a job somewhere, get an apartment, learn how to get to the job and so forth. It's not impossible to think that a child with a disability couldn't do that, but you have to look at, does the program prepare the students to transition back into their home community if that is where the student is going to be functioning um, for at least a while after um, they go to transition only services. So, Students should have the opportunity to participate in the local community, especially where they're going to be functioning. And services consist less of academic instruction, unless the students are taking classes at a college level. They can be taking classes in adult education, for example, also. And it should be more integrated in real life learning in areas such as workplace skills, career exploration, learning strategies and study skills, particularly for those who are going on to further learning, 
um, self-determination, self-advocacy. Transportation is a huge one that many districts forget to look at. Um, and adult daily living skills, not just cooking, doing laundry and grocery shopping, but when do I know I have to go to the emergency room versus my doctor? Um, how do I order my medication? How do I make a doctor's appointment? Um, how do I find out what social activities are available? How do I register for classes at the community college or an adult education? All right, so those are what we consider adult daily living skills. So <clears throat> one of the um, tricky parts about a community-based transition only service is that there are a number of requirements that are placed on these programs if the students are going out to work by the Department of Labor, both the Federal Department of Labor and the State Department of Labor. Students have to be a certain age before they can work. They have to get employment papers so that they can work. Many years ago, the state, the Federal Department of Labor and the Federal Department of Education put together an agreement that allowed students with disabilities to be able to go out and work in the community without having to follow all of the rules and regulations of the Department of Labor. So this is what some of these are. So I will sometimes have a parent who says to me, um, my child wants to, be, wants to work in construction. So why do I need an internship at the Big Y bagging groceries? There's a couple of reasons for that. These three areas that are highlighted in purple are the three areas that a transition only community-based program can do. And the students are only allowed certain number of hours for a certain job on a certain work site. So I remember coming on board and having a district one time that says to me, I said, well, when do you meet with the student? And they said, well, we don't, he works full time. He's on an IEP, but he works full time. And I'm like, well, who's supervising him? And what goals and objectives are he working on? Well, he's working full time. That's not what transition services are. Transition services are a learning experience, learning pre-employment skills, like being on time for a job, learning how to communicate with an adult, learning how to get along with your coworkers and your peers. It's, it's exploring variety of career paths and interests. It's learning how to get to your job. It's learning how to prepare your lunch if you have to bring your lunch to your job. And then if you get up to a particular area where you find a good match, it might be some actual vocational training, learning specific job skills that you could then transfer into a real job once you exit high school. So it's important to understand as, as parents that there are only certain number of hours you can spend in each of these areas. So in terms of vocational exploration, let's say you have a student who goes to work in Stop and Shop. Each job shadow might be a different section of Stop and Shop. So cashier might be one job, and they can spend five hours exploring that job to see if that's a good match. They might work five hours in the bakery. They might work five hours stocking shelves. They might work five hours bagging groceries. Um, so even within one site, there can be multiple jobs that they're exploring. So that's why a student doesn't necessarily get placed in th their first preference area because they have to learn some of these pre-vocational skills. And even once they do get into an area that they're very interested in, they can only spend a certain number of hours in that job doing certain things. So it's, it's important to understand this aspect of the vocational piece. This has nothing to do with students who might be taking college courses um, in a transition only program, but this is for the work site portion of a community-based program. So the other things to remember is that students who are in these services need ongoing support. So the student I mentioned before who was working totally on his own, 
didn't need this service, these services, because he was working on his own. Now, if he needed support to take college level courses, that might have been a, di a different type of uh, community based program. So that all the students in these services need some type of ongoing support, not, not a uh, constant job coach necessarily, but some kind of support. Um, all of their participation is on the supervision of school personnel, not just the employers. Um, it has to be clearly defined what the student is working on in the IEP. Um, I will tell you, however, that you don't want the location written in the IEP because let's say the student is working at the gap and the gap closes, then you have to go back to PPT and put in another location. So retail store, uh, food service industry, something like that was fine to go in the IEP, but not a very specific uh, location where the student might be working because that will change from time to time. Uh, the student and parent or guardian have to be fully informed that participation in a community-based vocational component of the IEP um, and agree that the student is not entitled to wages. I won't go into this issue, but there are some programs that do pay their students a stipend. Um, that has been an informal agreement between the Connecticut Department of Labor and many school districts. Um, if you wanna know more about that, you can certainly talk to me, but the students are not entitled to wages in these types of programs, although it, it may happen. The students are not also entitled to employment at the end of transition only services, although sometimes that happens. Sometimes they do so well that the employer wants to hire them. And therefore, because of all of these issues, an employer employee relationship does not exist, which is the reason why the federal and state Department of Labor laws often do not apply. Some of them will still. So for example, I mentioned before that there was a student who wanted to work in um, construction. And the, one of the reasons that students who are in high school can't typically work in construction is because there is a labor law that says a student has to be at least 18 before they can step foot on a construction site. So there still are some Department of Labor regulations that districts have to follow and cannot bend, um, but they are able to get students out working in real life community work sites, which is a, a huge benefit preparing for them for life after high school. All right, so we are at a good point. Do you guys wanna take a break at all? No, we'll just keep going, okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit now about how do you request these community-based transition services and some of the things that you and your child need to think about when doing this requesting, because it's not an automatic. So transition planning involves identifying goals and objectives for post-school activities based on age-appropriate assessment not just selecting a placement. So you don't come into a PPT and say, I want my child to go to X program without understanding why you're requesting that program. So the most important advice I can give you for any kind of transition service, but particularly for transition only services, is you have to know what the goals and objectives are that the student wants to work towards before you can pick where those services are gonna happen. And that applies to any goals and objectives in the IEP, but it's particularly important for transition only services. So for example, if you have a student who wants to go to college and the only transition, only, only community-based transition program that's offered through that district is the one that only supports students in a worksite setting, then that may not be the most appropriate program to help your child reach his goals and objectives of going to college. 
even if the school district says, this is how we do transition. This is what our transition only services look like. The student is still entitled to an individualized IEP, but if you don't know what his, in, his or her individual goals and objectives are for life after high school, then you're not gonna be able to find the right and the most appropriate placement. So this is, if you don't remember anything else tonight, this is a key goal. It's the only way you're gonna be able to advocate for the types of services that you want or your son or daughter wants. You also need to make sure that transition goals are based on age appropriate assessment results. This is easier said than done. Um, I will be doing a session later in the spring on transition assessment, which will go over this in a little bit more detail. But the example that I like to use is if you have a student who shows up in a math class, teachers never seen the student before, typically the first thing the student will do, I mean, the teacher will do is give the student a test to see what math skills the student knows and what they don't know, then develop goals and objectives for what they need to work on. Then at the end of the year, we'll test them to see what they learned so they can develop the next set of goals and objectives. Same thing should apply to transition goals and objectives. The issue is the types of assessments are much more broad and varied than a math test or a reading test. So it could involve academics because every job involves some level of reading, writing, or math. Um, it involves interests. Certainly interests and preferences are important, but it also involves, for example, going on to college. What kind of study skills does the student have? Can the student advocate for accommodations? Do they know what accommodations they need? So there are many different areas and the assessment doesn't necessarily have to be a paper pencil test or a standardized test. It can be many different things. You just don't want someone picking a goal out of a bank of goals and having no reason for why that particular student needs to work on that goal. So this piece goes along with those transition goals and objectives. Um, bullet that was right above. Uh-oh, I didn't mean to do that. Let's go back again. Sorry, I hit the wrong button. Okay, so once you have the goals and, and objectives identified by the PPT, so the PPT has to agree on these goals and objectives, then you can discuss where is the best place for the student to reach or work towards these goals and objectives. So those three bullets are the guts of why and how you request transition only services. Remember that transition only services do not have to be a specialized program. They only have to be coordinated set, but individualized activities. I remember at one point I had, uh, I worked with a family who had twins. And when I looked at their transition goals and objectives, they were exactly the same. And these twins were by no means exactly the same. And they had very different ideas about what they wanted to do after high school. So this is why having an individualized IEP, especially around transition goals and objectives is critically important to choose it in transition only services. So here are some questions that you may want to think about with your son or daughter. If the student will be turning 18 when they go into these services, have you discussed the transfer of majority with them and what will that look like? Are they going to take over the responsibility for being at their PPT and signing off on their IEP? Um, is there going to be a statement that says, the student gives the parent permission to do that. Is there going to be power of attorney or guardianship or conservatorship? All of that has to be known up front. So the school district um, and the other services that the student will be working with know who they have to be dealing with. So that's number one. And that you should be looking at at age 17 uh, 
making those kinds of decisions. What does a student want to do after high school? It's really hard for any student to think beyond tomorrow or next week, but they do have to think, do they, are they gonna always live at home? Do they wanna live on their own? Do they wanna go to college? Do they wanna work? And transition should be finding the answers to these questions. So we expect an eighth grader or a ninth grader to say, I don't know what I wanna do after high school but then they should be doing transition goals and objectives and services that help them rule things out. Do they wanna work with people? Do they wanna work with animals? Do they wanna work inside? Do they wanna work outside? Do they wanna make a lot of money? Do they wanna buy a car? Um, so whatever things they wanna do after high school will help to form a decision about the kind of career path or goal they wanna do or take and what kind of education or training they need in order to be able to do um, that career path or that job. Um, what are the students' interests and preferences? Um, I bet I, if I were to ask every single one of you, if you're currently working in your very first job, the majority are, of you are gonna say no, um, because we all worked in jobs to learn how to work, to make money, to put gas in the car, to go to the movies or whatever. Um, before we actually started thinking about a lifelong career or, or something that met more of our needs in terms of putting food on the table, taking care of a family and so forth. Where will the student live, at least initially? How will the student get around in the community? Remember I said before, transportation is one of those areas that many times um, school districts forget to look at. I had one school district that had a student on the spectrum who wanted to be an accountant. Um, he had interviewed on his own with an accountant firm, was doing an internship there, was taking accountant courses in the community college. And their question to me was, should I keep this student in their transition only program till the end of the year? It was like January. And I said to them, how does the student get to work? Mom. So I said, well, you might need to work on transportation and figure out how the student is going to get to a job or a college course on his or her own before you decide that they're ready to go off into the world of work. So transportation is a huge issue. Um, these next areas are things that the student needs to understand what transition only services mean. It means they can participate in graduation, but they're not gonna go off to college like many of their peers. Are they okay with continuing on with school, whatever that might look like, even though it might not be in the same high school building and it might be in a new location. Some students are and some students aren't, and we can't force a student to take transition only services. That's voluntary, but they have to understand that when summer ends, they're going back to school in some way, shape or form. Does the student understand that, that she can participate in graduation, senior activities, but no, will not receive the diploma until they exit high school? They also need to understand that they can end these services at any time by requesting that from the PPT. If they get a job and they don't wanna go through these services anymore, they can ask to be exited from school and the PPT cannot deny that. Um, so these are the kinds of issues that the student needs to understand before they can actually make an informed decision. So this is kind of the end here and, and then I'll be happy to open up for questions. Um, this is some of the resources that I put on this separate uh, Word document that is posted for you. There's a number of topic briefs that look at writing what we call post goal outcome goal statements. So those are the big transition goals. And I put these three bullets here because not every student is gonna go on to college, but they all are going to have to learn their whole life. So they need lifelong learning skills, even if they may never go to a college. Not everybody is going into competitive employment. 
but they all want to be able to give back to their community to do something useful to um, help out their families, their uh, parents, their community, their neighbors. So there's a range going from competitive employment to other kinds of tasks and even volunteer work. And independent living skills can be everything from learning to dress yourself and pick out an, a, an appropriate outfit for the weather that day to making medical and health decisions for yourself and self-advocating. So there's a huge range of transition skills and services that play into what kind of community-based trans transition-only services are going to be available. The other document I refer you to are the core transition skills. Um, these are 16, or did we go up? Um, 16, okay. Um, 16 areas, they're not written as goals, but 16 areas to the transition task force put together um, that we felt were critical for all students to be successful in life after high school. So if you don't know what goals and object objections should be, you can look at the core transition skills and find an area that your child might need to work a little bit more on. Also explore, there are district and college collaborations in almost every district. Many districts have a partnership with a college and a student can take maybe their first course free or there are college courses taught in the high school. Um, those might be options that your student can take advantage of even before they exit or even after they exit um, or in their senior year that don't necessarily have to be in a transi transition only services program. There is also a website called Think College, particularly for students with intellectual disabilities and other developmental disabilities. And there are a number of college programs for those students in colleges around the country. So there are other resources, and I think a couple of those are even in Connecticut and nearby in Massachusetts. So those are the ones I wanna highlight. There are many more on the uh, Word document that the resource sheet that I published for you. Um, but I think we're at a point now where, oops, I'll come back to these if we have time, um, where we can take some questions. Wonderful. We do have a few questions, but first, um, I'm going to launch a poll. We do want your feedback for our Transition Tuesdays. So if you just take a look at the chat, you'll see a link to the poll. No, you have to launch the poll. It's getting there. Oh, there it is. There it is. All right. Sorry, I thought you were referring no, my, to My chat. computer's slow. <laughs> Got it. Sorry. No, that's okay. Okay. So... We do have a question regarding gate, uh, step forward from Gateway. They wanna know, is it considered a community transition only program? Yes. Okay. It should be listed in EdSite. Mm -hmm. Okay. And a question from Facebook. What if the program the parent thinks or knows is thinks it is appropriate and the district does not agree with it? <laughs> Well, that's an age old issue and it's, it's not a simple answer. I would go back to the three bullets that I showed you before. If you are clear on the goals and objectives for the student and the PPT has agreed on those um, and the student is okay with going into transition only services, you take a look at what the district is offering in terms of transition only services and see if it will meet the student's needs. The example I gave about a student who wants to go to college and the transition only services program does not support students to take college courses, then it's probably not the most appropriate program. It might be useful for worksite experience, but not for supporting the student. So that's where a coordinated set of activities might be able to be brought in uh, so to, to support the student in taking a college course and then the other program for worksite experience. But the bottom line is there may be certain things about a particular program. The, the districts are not obligated to put them in any program throughout the country. Um, they may have, because you know they may have to then pay living expenses. 
uh, you know, room and board. Um, certainly if a program is two hours away, they have transportation to consider. So there are a lot of issues around getting the student to a particular program and what other costs are involved. So looking back at those goals and objectives are absolutely critical. I was talking with a parent the other day whose child wants to go to UConn and I'm not so sure that UConn is an academic level that that student could handle, but the reason she wanted to go to UConn is so she could board her horse there. And you certainly can find a place to board your horse near a college that might be more appropriate for you to take academic courses in. So there are many different reasons why. Other people have wanted to go to programs because they have a swimming program and their child wants to do that. The bottom line is if you and the district cannot agree, the district cannot mandate a particular program, you would have to go through the due process uh, system in order to either go to a, a, a mediation or a hearing. Um, if you and the district cannot agree on a particular program. But if the district agrees on goals and objectives and you have uh, some idea of the direction you wanna head in, that makes it a lot easier and it makes it easier for you to advocate for your child. The next question is, what about the Cheshire program at Quinnipiac? Again, I've been away from these programs for a while, so I'm speaking of a couple of years ago, but Quinnipiac has two programs, I believe, and they're both, I mean, sorry, Cheshire has two programs and they're both housed at Quinnipiac. What we started out with in Connecticut, these age appropriate programs were for students who had lower functioning abilities, who wanted to be in with, with their age appropriate peers, which oftentimes were co college level students. So they would do worksite experiences on the campus or in the local community. They would do lunch buddies with some of the college students. Some of the college students might take them to recreational activities or sporting events. They might join clubs on campus. Um, and what we learned was if you had students who could take college level courses, those programs didn't offer enough for them. So what, what Cheshire did is they started a second program that was specifically designed to support students who were taking college level courses on the campus. They might also have worksite experiences, but it was a, a different set of services than a student who was a lower functioning student might need. So I don't know which Quinnipiac Cheshire program you're talking about, but they do have two. And again, you need to know what the the goals and objectives are for your child to know which program meets their needs better. And many, many districts have done that and split into two programs for that very reason. Okay, can you speak to any programs in Northeast Connecticut? Um, I don't like to recommend programs. I'm happy to talk to or email with the family and help them look at ed site and see what programs are available but i can't really help you unless you have those three bullets answered your child's goals and objectives where they're going to live what they're going to do after high school and um you know what their needs are there isn't one great transition only services program they all have great things, they all have areas that they could work on. Um, and it really boils down to the needs of the individual student and what's the best match. And then like I said, it has to be a coordinated set of activities so that you can always pull in additional services if a particular program doesn't meet 100% of their needs. Okay, this one's a longer question. How do we determine what our child might need in a transitional program? It just jumped, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it literally just jumped. Okay, let me scroll back up, I apologize. 
Okay, here we go. My son is below grade level with some significant learning disabilities as well as an ED diagnosis. He can barely get his high school work done and don't feel like college is in his future. Not sure what school, what we should even be asking for school for at this point. Did, did you say it was a grade level? It is below grade level. No, no, no. What grade is he? What grade? Doesn't Just say. Just high school does not say. Okay. So this is why you don't necessarily have this conversation about transition only services till maybe the senior year. What you should be looking at is the same things as you would with any other student, what are his interests, what are his preferences, what does he think he wants to do, and kind of focus on that to see if it fits or it doesn't fit. Um, there are many students who feel like college is out of their reach. Um, so taking them to a college, helping them see what goes on at college, having them talk to college students, the difference between a community college versus a four-year school, for example, even starting to take classes in adult ed, like a continuing ed course, like French cooking or Photoshop, you know, could be anything. It's a learning environment where there might not be as much support, um, where the student could not go in with the stigma of being you know, a student with a disability. So helping them build those experiences will help to answer some of the questions about what the student wants to do. Um, certainly understanding for a student with a learning disability that there's a lot of, for all students, but particularly for a student with a learning disability, there's a lot of technology that can make the academic work a whole lot easier from reading to the student, to helping with writing, to organizing, um, taking tests, all kinds of technology that could be learned to use for further learning, but also for employment. Um, we also find that if a student has behavioral problems, we don't find those same behavioral problems often happen in a work site or an outside setting. Um, if you can reduce some of the stresses with technology or help the student to build some self-advocacy skills, things are gonna improve. This, this student might benefit from transition-only services just because of a maturity level, just because of experiencing new things and being successful with support, as opposed to graduating, getting a job and losing job after job after job because the supports aren't there. So that's one of the benefits of community-based transition-only services is having those supports built in so the student can build their confidence, learn what works and learn how to ask for it and get those things once they're gonna be on their own. We have one from Facebook. Referring to the questions for students that Pat mentioned a few slides back, what if the student is not able to answer all those questions about what they want to do or not to do? That's not unusual, particularly for a student who's just beginning to think about transition. So some of their transition activities while they're still in school should be, how do I find the answers to that question? So almost every student has taken an, an interest inventory and many times they don't even see the results and nobody sits down and goes over them with them. Asking them about what they like to do in their spare time for hobbies um, will give you an idea of what the student's abilities are, weaknesses are, interests are. Um, so I'm not saying that a student will know the answers to those questions right off the bat, but those questions will guide their goals for after high school. And they also need to understand is those goals are gonna change many, many, many times. So the process we're going through with them is something that they will do over and over and over again throughout their lives. Every time they lose a job or they wanna change a job or they get bored or they wanna go back to school, this pattern will re re repeat itself so having them understand that at the moment, this is what I think I wanna do. 
So let's try it out. Let's explore it virtually. Um, talk to somebody who works in that job. And after a while, they may say, you know, I don't think I could be a doctor because I can't stand the sight of blood. Okay, so what could you do that's, that you like about being a doctor, but that doesn't involve blood? Okay, so it takes time to explore the thousands and thousands of jobs that are out there, um, career paths and so forth, um, and this then finding what's a good fit for you at the moment, because that is gonna change. What if the school has a coffee shop at, what if the school has a coffee shop at the school and that is all they do for transition services? I do not feel this is enough. My daughter has ID and doesn't understand the transition process. She's a senior and the school isn't giving her what she needs, but won't agree, but won't agree she needs more. What do I do? What do I need to do next? Her PPT is coming up next week. I go back to that slide. The three key questions. What goals and objectives does she want to look at? Look at the core transition skills. Um, look at samples of post-school outcome goal statements to write. Um, there's several topic briefs that are listed on that page of the website. Very easy to read, very simple statements. If your daughter has some idea of what she wants to do, then you can fight for services and activities besides the coffee shop. The coffee shop is fine as a beginning, but unless she's gonna own her own coffee shop, once she gets out of high school, it's not enough. The bottom line is, if she can't convince the district that the coffee shop is not sufficient for transition, then she may have to go and, re and request a mediation. Okay, next question. Is the district required to provide a spectrum of services? If we are told our child is too high functioning or more independent than the students that would be in the district's own program, should they be offering something that would be more specific, specifically suited for our child? Absolutely. So this is what I mean when I say the district says transition services are only for low functioning students who can't function on their own. That's not true. That's not what IDEA says. Every student has a right to identify what they want their post-school outcomes to be, their post-school goals. Um, it could be being a brain surgeon, right? And if that student has disabilities and needs additional support in learning how to take science classes, learning how to handle the reading and the vo vocabulary that, that are gonna come up in science classes, that's as important a transition skill for that student as it is for a lower functioning student to know how to chop potatoes in a restaurant, all right? So absolutely, there is no one thing as what one set of transition services, but if you don't identify what the student's goals and objectives are and the direction they wanna head in, then you don't have any ammunition to fight with. So a high functioning student is just as entitled to transition services as a low functioning student. Okay, there's a second part to that question. Um, should there also be programs other than just a referral to BRS? Yes, a refer referral to BRS, state agencies like BRS um, don't take all students with disabilities. They have their own criteria. So it's important to understand that. They do have BRS and, and BESB do have services called Level Up, which look at pre-employment transition services, which are very similar to transition services. Um, they should happen concurrently with whatever the district is offering. One does not replace the other. Um, not every student sh should be referred to BRS. Um, some students will have better success with BRS than others, but that is not the answer to transition services. There should be something more than that that the district 
should be able to provide. BRS or adult services is one path, and usually those don't kick in until after the student exits high school. So it's not the only answer. Appreciate understanding where the student will live after high school is critical. Are there other states which are known to have good programs? Where students with disabilities will live is always an issue in every state, just like transportation is an issue. Um, what I find is uh, most encouraging is often the creative creativity of parents. Very often you will find parents who get together and they may purchase a, a, a house and turn it into apartments and then they all chip in and they pay for the staff that will kind of oversee their children if they're living in an environment. Um, there are no easy answers for that, but you will find in some states there are programs where people who don't have a disability will offer to live with a person with a disability independently and kind of be a caretaker or a coach type of thing. So it really depends on your child's abilities, um, what kind of support, what kind of independence and responsibility they can take as to um, what kind of um, housing options are available to them. There used to be a lot more available in this state. There actually used to be a housing I don't know if it was called a coalition or whatever. Um, and they did some fabulous things. Unfortunately, dollars are being cut back. We may see some of that begin to come back. I hope so. Um, I would certainly encourage parents to continue to advocate for those needs for um, their children who are gonna become adults because not every family can have the child still living at home. And you don't want them to have to become a ward of the state just because you're not able to provide the living arrangement that they need. Does the program help the student pass the military ASVAB test or driver's test? That's not typically, certainly the ASVAB is, is an abilities test. So mm -hmm. there's really no coaching that you can do to pass that test. Um, Certainly there have, been, there have been districts who have worked with students to pass the driver's test, both the, the physical test and the written test. Um, my understanding from people who have done this is the Department of Motor Vehicles has a lot of different kinds of accommodations and supports to help students pass the written portion of the test. And there are organizations um, including Easter Seals that will do evaluations of students to see if they're capable of learning how to physically drive. Certainly those are things that you can request at district support. Um, however, if you think about students, a regular student who takes driver ed, which might be offered at the school, typically I believe the family pays for the driver's ed, it's not paid for by the school district. So, um, everything can be worked out on an individualized basis. So for example, the district might agree to pay for an evaluation to see if the student could learn to drive, may help the family find a driving school that specializes in working with students with disabilities and they do exist. I don't think there are many, but they do exist. Um, and then the family would have to pay for the driving uh, lessons, for example. So it is an area of negotiation, but it's not an automatic. Next question. My son is a senior, the school wants him to graduate, but I do not think he is ready. What can I do to fight it? I go back to the goals and objectives. If you don't think he's ready, go back to the core transition skills, take a look at um, one of the topic briefs on writing goals and objectives, has a whole list of skills under college, under employment, under self-advocacy. If there are a number of things that your child cannot do and he needs those skills to be successful at whatever his goal is, that's the ammunition you use. It has to be concrete and fairly documentable um, that 
He needs to be able to get around the community. You haven't worked on any kind of transportation skills. That could be anything from learning how to cross the street safely to getting a driver's license to learning how to use Uber or Lyft, taking a bus, um, hooking up with people at work to carpool. Um, you know, it could be any number of things. So um, again, if you don't know where the child is headed, then you're gonna have a hard time justifying that he is or is not ready to graduate. Okay, I do not see any more questions in the chat. Anything from Facebook, Beth? Anything else? Uh, no, I posted pretty much everything from Facebook. Um, the one comment from um, a parent is, um, about having these conversations with the student. So um, some kids think that they, you know, don't really need any supports and they're fine. Um, but, you know, the parents know that they do need the supports and how tough of a conversation that can be. I can, I can just jump in and say one thing that I often find when I talk with families in this situation is the student thinks that they're just gonna go back to the high school and they're, you know, they don't want to do that because everyone else has graduated and moved on to employment or, you know, whatever um, other things. So sometimes it's more about showing the student what the possibilities are as opposed to, you know, yeah, you graduated, but now you're going right back to the school that everyone else your age has left. So I'll say two things very quickly. And then I just wanted to highlight what my last two slides were so that might give you the parents some additional information. Um, there's two issues. This is why we don't wait until senior year to talk about transition. Because let's say the student that you're talking about has never really had an employment opportunity or has never stepped on a college campus and, and doesn't know if they're able to handle uh, taking college level courses. This is why in, the, in their sophomore, junior, even senior years, you want them trying these things to see if they can do it or not. Well, there are people around to support them if they struggle. That's why these services are important. The second thing is many of these transition only services will not let parents shop for them, but they might allow a student, particularly with the district's permission, to visit them and talk to some of the students who are in the program and see what the program has to offer. And that's what I think, Beth, you were talking about. Um, having them understand they will not be coming back to the school. If that's the only thing the school has to offer, that's a bit of a fight, but you can explain to them, you can show them all of the services on ed site doesn't tell you what they are but there's 150 of them out there they're not all the same um but those are the two best things that you can do um to help the student see that they may need some additional support but build that's why transition services are important before you get to age 18. so let me just say real quickly the last two slides that i didn't go through are just areas that might be covered in the community-based transition-only services. Um, assistive technology, how to use it on the job, um, IDEA compliance, um, some of the things we've talked about today, job coaching, life coaching, on-site supports that the employer might offer in a, in a job setting, the whole issue of paid versus unpaid employment, ideas around social media and internet safety, um, supporting students to take college courses, making sure they're working with non-disabled peers, transportation, using data. How do I decide if this is the right job for me? How do I decide how many college courses I should take? What major I should do? Um, and then the last area of the Workforce Innovation and Opportunity Act, um, which looked at some of the things that we talked about, um, sheltered workshops, customized employment, those are all different aspects of employment that 
districts can implement besides just sending a student out to the work site. So there are a lot of areas to explore when you're trying to choose or select the most important um, community-based transition services. And by no means is it an easy task. We do have another question that popped up. Are situational assessments still performed by districts? I feel like this would be difficult to push for. Um, obviously, during the pandemic, that's probably not something that's going to happen all that often. There is a lot of uh, information available virtually so that a student can see what a job is like virtually. Um, even if they can't go and visit a particular job, obviously we're working under some difficult constraints right now. Um, hopefully that will ease up in the next year or so. Um, situational assessments in a normal time period certainly are things that a district should do. Certainly there are things that some of the adult agencies do. Um, and it's, it's both an assessment technique to get a student placed in an appropriate job or career. And it's also a good evaluation technique to see if students are able to do things independently or see what, how much support they need. Um, some of it we can potentially do by video um, or through something like Zoom where you can observe a student doing certain things, but it's certainly not going to be in the same kind of work environments um, as, as we had pre-pandemic, but situational assessments are definitely a key area for particularly lower functioning students who are getting to decide what kind of a career or a job that they want to go into. Does anybody have any other questions at this time? I just wanted to um, add one other thing. I don't see any others on Facebook either. Um, the youth advisory, the uh, yeah, the youth advisory board um, is planning some presentations, and one of them we are hoping to bring in. A young adult who talks about driving and all of the different resources um, around getting your, uh, you know, getting a driver's license and some of the schools that are available to work with students with disabilities um, because that really does make a big difference. Mm -hmm. So um, if you're on our mailing list, um, which if you signed up for this, you will be on our mailing list, then you'll get that information as well if you are interested in specific youth advisory board information, um, uh, stay tuned and we'll be adding that to our newsletter, our Facebook page, social media, all of that. We, have, we did have a question pop up. What if the students' ideas of employment aren't too realistic or probable? <laughs> all right, that's not unusual. Um, again, I would say this is why we talk about transition early on so that you can explore what the student feels is the right direction for him or her. Have them look at concretely what kind of academics do they need, what kind of social skills, what kind of physical abilities, what kind of academic skills, what kind of education they need, um, you know, and help them to hopefully make that decision themselves. So for example, if you have a young man who's um, five, six, and he wants to be an NBA basketball player, the likelihood is pretty slim that that's something that's gonna work for him. But you telling him that is not gonna make as big a difference as if he talks to NBA basketball players or other professional players, maybe college level players, whatever. Um, the other aspect, whenever a student has a career path that may seem unrealistic is to talk about plan A, plan B, and plan C. Because anything can happen. You take the NBA basketball player that 
blows out their knees, it can no longer play basketball, they have to have some way of making a living. So I remember one student who um, wanted to make a living as an artist. And when he found out how difficult that would be to make enough money to survive, he did a little exploring and decided he wanted to be a personal care assistant, but not in a nursing home or a rehab facility. He wanted to work with individuals. And he was very happy doing that and could pursue his art on the side. So having an unrealistic career path is a learning opportunity. And I would say many, not all, students will come to a conclusion as to whether that's the best path for them. And if not, just helping them to look at other options to have a fallback plan in case something happens is another approach that you can take. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for the opportunity. Absolutely. Um, so I want to thank everybody for joining us. And our next presentation will be March 9th with Jennifer Sullivan, who will be discussing transition to college readiness skills for young adults with disabilities. Off we go. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. Bye-bye.